Hey, hey, Warrior Saints, good morning. Welcome, God bless and keep all of you. Beautiful to see all of these faces. I love that we're all, we're getting closer to being all together. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Welcome everyone, welcome those also at home watching with us. I've told this story before, but I'm gonna tell it again because it's one of my most favorite stories. It's a powerful, powerful story. There is a retired Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink, and Jocko wrote this book uh, called Extreme Ownership. And in the beginning, the first chapter, he talks about something called a blue on blue. And what that means is Jocko had planned a, a mission into the city of Ramadi in 2006 when he was stationed there. And they were going to go and try to find some insurgents and, and remove them. He uses this beautiful phrase, in the fog of war, everything went haywire. And it ended up being that some of the Navy SEALs were in a, in a place where they were not supposed to be, and they got confused and started firing on their own team, who fired back. And in the, in the chaos of it all, uh, I think it was one Iraqi soldier who was with them died, and, or two maybe died, but somebody died, at least, at least one, and a, a Navy SEAL was injured in the battle. Now Jocko, back at base, knew something wasn't right and runs out there, and that's how they discovered that it was what they call a blue on blue, or fratricide. What that means is you die by friendly fire. So unfortunately, the, the Navy SEALs killed one of the, or one or two of the Iraqi soldiers that were with them. Now, in that moment, Jocko was back at base. He wasn't with his SEALs out in the city. He was back at base. So he calls everyone together, and his superior officers came in. Blue on blue is the worst thing. Like it, you, I mean, they would rather die themselves than take the life of someone on their own team. It's the worst thing that could happen to the military. And so with all of his superior officers around, Jocko starts to question his team. Whose fault is this? Dead silence. I said, whose fault is this? Nothing. After a, a, a repeated uh, questioning, finally one of the SEALs says, oh, it's my fault, sir, I, I, I was in the wrong position. It's not your fault. Another SEAL, sir, it was, it was, it was my fault, I, I didn't radio uh, properly. It's not your fault. It's my fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Finally, in the most unexpected manner, Jocko says to them, it's my fault. And I'm like, what? As I was reading this, I was like, what are you talking about? You planned a perfect plan. You were back at the base. Your team was out in the city. How, how could it be your fault? But it is because Jocko is willing to be responsible and take responsibility for everything around him, everything within his control, that he not only kept his job, because there was tentative, uh, it was tentative for him, not only did he keep his job, but he went on to have a very distinguished, honorable career and what the SEALs did in, in Ramadi in 2006 is really what helped us put all of that insurrection down. So because he was willing to take responsibility and not make excuses and not pass blame elsewhere, Jocko went on to be most successful. Now to put that in context for you and I today, responsibility is something that many of us, in fact all of us, talk about. We want to have responsibility, and yet it's a rare commodity, right? I mean, most of what we do in our lives today, and look, I'm picking on all of us, myself included, is to blame other people and to pass the responsibility to someone else, right? It's, it's, it's her fault, but it wasn't me, it was, it, was, it was him. They did this to me, right? Like, we pass the responsibility for all of the things that happen in our lives elsewhere to other people. Now responsibility literally is defined as being responsible, accountable for all things within your control. For all things within your control. To pass blame and not accept responsibility is a dangerous thing. Now listen to this. What we tend to do when we pass the blame is to make the other person a villain, right? She, she did it. She did it to me, it's her fault. She's the big bad villain. He is the villain. The priest is the villain. The world becomes the villain. When you make other a villain, something else happens. You become a victim. Look what she did to me. Look what he did to me. Look what the priest did to me. Look what the world has done to me. And now you are a villain, sorry, you are the victim, whom the villain is in complete control of you. You have no control anymore. Do you understand that? Because if you're a victim, things happen to you. They don't happen because of you. 
They don't happen through you. Victims have things happen to them. And when things happen to us, when we have allowed ourselves to play the role of victim, we have completely relinquished control. And therefore, we have no say in the outcome of our life. Now, God weighs in on this very, very early on in Scripture. In fact, the very beginning. There is this beautiful story that you all know about Adam and Eve. And God puts them in this beautiful garden. And he says to them, live and prosper. But just don't touch that one tree, which you know, of course, they did. And what does Adam say? Watch what Adam does. Like, as soon as God comes into the garden, after they've eaten it, he says what? The woman you gave me tricked me and I ate. Like, do you hear that? The woman you gave me, God, you villain, right? You hear what he did? He made God into the villain. You did this to me, God. And she tricked me. How dare her? I mean, poor me, right? Like, I was tricked. I became the victim. Out of control. And ladies, don't smirk, because Eve was just as bad. Well, wait, wait, God, the, the serpent tricked me. Like, right away, she passed the blame as well. Do you see that? And because of this, we'll never know what would have happened if they repented and asked God, to forgiveness, asked God for forgiveness to stay in the garden. But instead, by becoming victims, making God and the snake the villains, they were completely out of control and were therefore cast from the garden. Now, you contrast that story to a beautiful story that Jesus tells us or that we see in the Gospel of Luke in an interaction with Jesus. In chapter 8, there is the story of Jesus walking through the city. And there's people all over him, and everybody's touching him because it's like crowded, right? He's like a crowded street, and everybody's around him. And a woman is sick. She has, it says, a flow of blood for years and years, and she spent everything she had to try to get healed. She went to every doctor. She saw, you know, naturopathic medicine, whatever. Right? She tried to do everything she could to be healed. And none of it worked. And so in the throng, she comes up to Jesus and she touches the hem of his garment and is immediately healed. Right? And Jesus feels it. He senses the power that has gone from him. And he asks, you know this story, he asks the people, who touched my garment? And Peter is like, you know, the disciples are like, Jesus, there's a million people here. Right? It's like, it's like you're at an NFL football game pre-COVID, right? Like, there's a million people here. And like, how, how are you going to, what do you mean someone touched you? Everybody's touching you. And Jesus is, no, uh, uh, I felt it. Somebody touched me. And she had a moment, that woman with the flow of blood could have easily ran, right? Hidden. I mean, that's the story. There's a million people around. It would have been very easy to vanish. And yet she took responsibility and said, coming forward, not knowing what would have happened to her, but coming forward, and it says in Luke chapter 8, that she declared before Jesus and all of them that she had touched him. She took responsibility and said, all right, I did it. It was I touched your, your garments, Lord. But because of that responsibility, and because of her unwillingness to become a victim and make anyone else a villain, because of her unwillingness to pass the blame, something powerful happened. She was healed. Whereas Adam and Eve did not take responsibility, they were kicked out the garden, right? But this woman, who was willing to take responsibility, hears the Lord say to her at the, in the very next verse, Woman, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And she was healed. Do you follow? In her taking responsibility, God blessed her with healing. And so likewise, beloved, we must be responsible, warrior saints, to take responsibility for everything in our life. It's, it's, it's no good anymore to pass the blame to anyone else because we lose, rather relinquish, control over the outcome of our lives. And so we ask, what are some practical points, some tools that we can implement in our lives immediately to start taking responsibility for all things in our life? And I'll tell you a funny one that I do, but it's a really good one. It is that in every situation, anytime something comes up, anything is uncomfortable, someone, you get into it with someone, whatever it may be, I begin by assuming I'm wrong. I begin from the position that the mistake was mine, that the sin was mine, that the fault is mine. Now you may say, Father Chris, nobody can be wrong all the time. Absolutely, nobody can be wrong all the time. But if I start from the position that I could be the one at fault, a lot of things happen. And first, most important, is that I maintain control. Because if I am wrong, I can apologize. And if I am not wrong, 
After examination, I discover that I am not wrong. I can be compassionate to the other and grant forgiveness to the other person. Do you understand? By assuming from the beginning I am wrong, I have eliminated the victim villainhood business that we talked about in the beginning. They may be the villain, and you may be a victim, but you didn't start there. Do you understand? You have assumed control. The second part of that is that as you, so, sorry, the second practical point. Now that we know we are beginning from a position of it's my fault, let's work through it, you have to be, you've got to be like Inigo Montoya waiting for Vicini. You go back to the beginning and run the tape again, play the movie again through your mind. Examine the entire situation. Ask yourself tough questions. Ask yourself honest questions. Did I? Did he? Did she? So that as we're replaying the movie in our heads, we are able to honestly and accurately say, maybe I, I do need to step up and take some responsibility. And when you do discover that indeed you do have some things to be responsible for, it, it's, 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 it's pretty simple. Practical point number three, right? What is that? Go say you're sorry. Don't, don't, don't let your pride and your ego for poor choices and bad actions keep you from the things that you love, right? It's like, it's so easy. Say you're sorry. And here's the thing. Who is going to tell you to go fly a kite if you apologize, right? People who love you will embrace you. They won't cast you out. Do you understand that? If, if we can squash our ego, and recognize we made some mistakes. It's not hard. Just apologize for them. I'm telling you, 99 times out of 100, people will forgive and embrace you, right? And that relationship and those things that you desire will be restored instead of maintaining an estrangement. And if there is that 1% of people who don't forgive you, you're probably better off without them in your life anyways, right? Let's just be honest. If they're not going to forgive you, I'll look and mock, right? God go with you. All right? And that leads, all of that leads to practical point number four. And this is a good one. It's, uh, it's just, I mean, you would think it's a no-brainer, but sometimes it is a no-brainer. It it's unbrained, right? Take confession. Just do it. Like, uh, just take the, receive the sacrament of confession. Like, if you've made a mistake and you're taking responsibility for the mistake that you made, come to God. Because God is going to forgive you like that. He, he desires to forgive you. Do you understand it? Like, it's not that he'll think about it. Or that God may flip a coin and there's the heavenly heads and tails, right? If you make that move, he will grant forgiveness. That's what the sacrament of confession is about. And look, I end here. We're all lost in the chaos that's out there. Like, it's, it's like turmoil, right? This is a, this is, we all feel like Peter walking towards Jesus on the water. And I don't know about you, but sinking because the chaos is out there, right? Let God bring that peace to you and that healing and that forgiveness that you desire anyways. Make the move. Come for the sacrament of confession. Receive God's blessings. You all know. Like, I don't forgive your sins. Who am I? I'm a, I'm a sinner myself. I've got to go take my own confessions. Excuse me, I have to take my own confessions. But God grants forgiveness, certainly in the church, through the priest. I got it. And how do you feel after confession? Dang, you feel good, right? Because you know, oh, I exhaled. I got it off my chest. I gave the sin to God. I took responsibility for my behaviors, and I gave it to God, and he healed me. And in a world out there, where so much healing is needed and sought after, why would we keep ourselves from it, right? So practical point number four, take the sacrament of confession. It's very simple. Here, all you need to do is call Tisha. She'll schedule us right away. Easy, right? Just do it. We'll make the time and get all of that off. Beloved in Christ, let's not be victims and let's not make others villains. Let's take responsibility for everything in our life. Take control of every aspect of your life, not in a malicious or malintended way, but so that you might further draw closer to Christ, becoming a warrior saint, and taking control as you continue to walk on the way of the warrior saint. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep you. Amen.